Here's a moral dilemma for you. If you had a brand new autonomous vehicle that was a driverless car that took you from point A to point B without you having to do much more than push a few buttons on a touchscreen, would you want that vehicle to sacrifice your own life to save a pedestrian? To me, that's kind of an interesting question. Sacrifice my own life for a complete stranger. And there's a whole bunch of moral dilemma questions that they have where, you know, if you see one person on a railroad track here and A and then another person on B or whatever, if you all you have to do is flip a switch and you sacrifice a family of kids versus some old man or whatever. And then there's another one where it's like, okay, you see a family on the railroad tracks, but you got a man right next to you and all you have to do is push and kill him off and then it saves a family somehow. You know, there's all these moral questions. But this is actually a really important question because it's a very potential one that could be in our near future as autonomous vehicles evolve and become more of our daily use. This question is, should this vehicle be programmed to automatically sacrifice you, you or your family's life in the vehicle to save pedestrians' life if the situation calls for it, which it very possibly could. At any given time, this could happen. And this article here that I found, it's on, on IFL Science, it's pretty much they're going through this moral dilemma. You know, should you actually program a vehicle that would be designed to kill the driver over a pedestrian? And then on top of that, my question is how do you really how do you distinguish who you'd want to save? You know, let's just say, for example, and I'm just going to throw this out here. Let's say you're driving down the road and you get put in a situation where you could either A, uh, save yourself or B, you know, save some, you know, old man in a wheelchair or something, right? So somebody might say, well, you know what? I'm young. I want to save myself. They're old. They shouldn't be there in the first place. You know, they might value their lives over that person because they feel like maybe they lived a longer life or, you know, whatever the case may be. But on the flip side of that, you might have kids. There's kids right here in the middle of the park of the driveway and you get put in a situation where you instinctively would veer off the road, whether you even think about saving yourself or not. It just might be an instinct thing. Oh, it's kids. Oh, shit. And you veer off to the left or whatever. How does a software program distinguish that? Is there any distinguishing, you know, factors there? Is it saying, hey, you know, young, old, a, a number of people, if there's more than one, more than two, more than three, you know, what guidelines are there? You know, this is going, I don't know, it's like mind-boggling. I mean, they did this survey, this is, this is interesting, they did a survey, and a lot of people said, oh yeah, this should be a thing, it should save the pedestrians and not the drivers, but then they said that they wouldn't want to drive a vehicle that would sacrifice them, that they'd rather just drive a vehicle that they drove themselves to make their own decision. You don't want to know why. Because most of those people probably would not sacrifice their own life to save a stranger. That's why. They wanted a car designed to save their kids, just in case some driverless car is veering down the road, but they don't want to be in that driverless car if it were to happen. Kind of hypocritical, but... By nature, humans are going to be wanting to survive. I mean, there's just, we have a survival instinct. That's just the way it is. So, interesting moral dilemma. Let me know what you think in the comments, what you would want it to do. And if not only do you think it should be programmed to save your life or theirs, but whatever your decision, would you buy one? And now we have a computer malware virus, whatever. This is interesting that they can actually get data off of a computer, like passwords or whatever kind of data you want to get off a computer after it's infected by changing the RPMs of the fan to transmit probably like a, like a Morse code almost, you know, on and off, you know, ones and zeros, not really a Morse code, but it's like ones and zeros of data from the computer. Now, this is reason that you would be like, what the hell? Why do you even need this? This is stupid. Well, there's something called air gap computers where there's absolutely no physical connection, you know, to other computers for security reasons. And they even have things where these same computers don't have microphones or speakers, um, you know, lights or things like that. Anything that could basically be used to transmit data. Well, this new malware takes advantage of fans because every computer is going to have, well, not every computer, most computers are going to have fans. Calling it the fan smitter, and basically what it does is it changes RPMs from one to another, giving it a zero or a one, enabling it to transmit data one bit at a time. And then they're able to pick this up by using the microphone off of like a cell phone. 
And I don't know the exact range, but in this perfect testing environment, they used the Samsung Galaxy S4. Uh, the testing environment was a computer lab with several other workstations, switchings, and air cooling systems, all of which which produced the background noise that did not interfere with the data transmission. Over the distance of one meter could transmit three bits per minute. So yeah, it would take three minutes, to, three minutes to transmit one byte of each character of the password or encryption key. So not not necessarily hyperspeed. I mean, this is definitely a little bit below dial-up, but for super secure passwords or for super secure su <laughs> for super secure computer systems on a national security level, maybe these passwords could be worth the you know, 10 hours it takes to download some kind of a hash or something that would be required to break into another system. Still pretty interesting. And on to Google making a new toy. Well, okay, they're not really making a new toy. They're making a system for other toy developers to make toys with that essentially is going to teach kids, this is pretty cool, to program using toys. Now they're making, they're developing the system and then they want to work with other toy uh, manufacturers, but these kids are going to go in here and learn to program just by playing with these toys. And they put these blocks together and then these blocks like follow programming instructions and they make robots do things and, uh, you know, achieve other goals or whatever. But it's kind of interesting because you have different blocks that do different functions in programming. You can change and, and program those on the computer and re, you know, flash them to do different things. So pretty interesting. Um, I definitely wish that this level of technology was around when I was in school and I learned programming, you know, as just a requirement. Uh, I think that programming in the future should be a requirement, even if it's basics, you know, to allow everybody to at least get their feet wet sort of thing. So I think this is very innovative, very interesting, and I can't wait to see this actually roll out as a full-fledged product that can be bought and you know, at just any Toys R Us that any kid can use to develop their programming skills, you know, from, I don't know, whatever age it is. Let's just say, let's see, how old are these kids? I'm really bad at kids' ages. Uh, this is taking longer than I wanted it to. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to say that kid is what? 10? I don't know. I'm really bad at ages. 11? 4? I have no idea. I'm going to go with 10. 10 is my guess. On to something a little bit more entertaining. Microsoft has actually paid a woman $10,000. $10,000 because they forced her to upgrade to Windows 10, which is hilarious. I love that news. It is hilarious. Basically, she said she has a small business and the forced Windows 10 upgrade crippled her business. I don't know for how long, but it crippled her business. She said she did not give any permission to upgrade to Windows 10, and she sued Microsoft. Now, the interesting thing really here is that Microsoft didn't even fight it. They just said they don't want to go through the legal battle, which makes sense because, you know, probably one hour of legal battle for them is worth way more than $10,000. But instead of doing all of that, they just paid her $10,000 and said, go away, go away. Kind of sets an, an interesting precedent because this was actually, this happened before Microsoft got super aggressive. This is before when there was just a few pop-ups where she very, very easily could have initiated this herself without actually being tricked into it. Now, she probably could have been tricked. She probably could have clicked the wrong thing on accident and still could have been tricked into doing it. But this is during a period where Windows really wasn't that aggressive. Just a little pop-up, you know, click here, maybe whatever. Nowadays, it's like, here's a box. You click this X, you're basically agreeing to install Windows 10, in which case you're just like, you but still very interesting i'd like to see more of these lawsuits and i totally saw this coming a long way a long time ago but i'd like to see more of these lawsuits aimed towards microsoft so they know that they can't pull this bullshit on people unfortunately the damage is already done if you guys have seen fight club you know that whole uh that, that cost that lawsuit versus um recall cost you know in fight club where they're just like well hey you know how many people are going to sue us how much is going to cost us to recall weigh the balance or the 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 cost for each one and they figure out whether or not they want to do a recall so for windows 10 i think this is actually on that same level right they're just like hey if a hundred thousand people sue us for ten thousand dollars and we just settle out of court we still got 4.9 billion trillion people to upgrade without them wanting to, right? And we're pulling all this data from them and selling all this to advertising. We're making a hand over fist profit 
based, you know, from what the people are actually suing us. I mean, we lost, you know, let's say a billion dollars in lawsuits, but we gained ten billion dollars in ad revenue or whatever. So this could be that it's like an educated risk for them. They're just like, you know what, sue us. We still made ten trillion billion dollars. Who cares about your ten thousand dollars? A new bug in Google Chrome has actually allowed pirates to directly request a video file from things like Netflix and Hulu and a couple other services. Now, this is actually not specifically for Chrome. However, it does use a base code that Chrome develop or Google developed. I think it's called Chromium. I'd have to read through it again, but it, it does affect other browsers just more so on Chrome. Essentially, the most common way to pirate something off of Netflix or Hulu or whatever when you're watching it in your browser is just to use a screen recording software. It's not perfect, but it will definitely get the job done. It just captures the screen that you're recording. And even technically, that's not illegal because you're not circumventing a DRM. You're just recording what you see. So it's not technically illegal. However, this new bug takes advantage of that talking between you know the servers, your media servers, and you, and it interferes and says, hey, I am you, and it just takes that, that stream directly, so you get a full high quality you know, download of that video file. So it's definitely illegal at this point, but the team that found this gave Google the information, and they gave them 90 days to fix it. This was on, the May, on May 24th, and they basically have until August 22nd to release, to release a patch before they release the information they have in order to obtain these digital files. Not really groundbreaking news. I just thought it was kind of interesting. That's all. Last on our list, we have solar roadways. Now, I've talked about solar roadways in the past. I've even, I think I've tweeted about them a little bit afterwards. But solar roadways are kind of an interesting concept because they replace uh, the roads with these little hectagon, you know, things that basically they have LEDs on it, they have uh, solar panels on it, they take energy and they convert it, you know, to you know, light structures or they can power other, other things. And, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, selling points for it, but they've actually been debunked and the math has been done and it's been, you know, proven that they're really not going to be as beneficial as they claim to be or at least as the the inventors want them to be. But now they're actually campaigning to put this, they're going to crowdsource it, but the solar roadway is actually going to be built on Route 66 as like some kind of a new technology thing. Um, but it's only going to be on a, in a, on a road stop or a truck stop. And there's kind of like a testing ground, really. But they're going to put all these in, and they're saying it's going to cost about $70 per square foot. Now, again, it's not going to be on a complete highway, but it is going to be a testing ground. They're going to put these in. I think this is interesting, and I can't wait to see this. The reason why is because I've seen the commercial on YouTube, the solar freaking roadways. What is it? It's solar freaking roadways. I've seen the commercial on YouTube, and it was, it was interesting. It makes you like like hope for the future. Like, hey, let's replace all of our roadways in the United States or in the entire world with solar panels. It's going to solve all of our problems. It's very... It's very dream enticing, right? It makes you just hopeful for the future. But then you see other videos, like I think it's EV blog or whatever. He just like debunks the entire crap out of it. Says there's no way that these are going to give you the return on investment that you hope for. And there's a bunch of other websites that do the exact same thing. They say, hey, these things are not possible. They're not going to work. Stop dreaming. So this, putting it to the test, even on a small scale, and even if it's just for publicity, will be very interesting. Interesting to see the net results on what it takes to get them installed, how much energy they produce, how much it's money it saves from them not having to power lights or other things, and what the maintenance is to see if overall the cost is there. Now, let's just say in this hypothetical dream world, it actually turns a profit or becomes sustainable energy without living on the grid and out, without having any major problems. This could be a milestone for a lot of other roads. Maybe not the existing roads we have now, but sometime in the future when we're building new roads, there might be an option. Do you want to build asphalt or do you want to build solar freaking roadways? And that would be a good option to have. Do I think it will? No, but it'd still be a good option to have. That's all the rambling for today, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and like this video below. Follow me on Twitter at underscore bite my bits and have a good day.